starting the Sermon on the Mount, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 5. And knowing that you were already there, I will begin. We have been in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Now this is our fourth week here, and I will wrap up this part of his sermon today. And, uh, and, and this is going to be a very sobering thought that, uh, that the Lord gives us in the sermon today. So, to pick up in verse 17, and I pretty much already uh, preached through verse 19, but, but we'll read those first three, two, with a focus today on verse 20. Jesus said, Do not presume that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever nullifies one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not hard to interpret. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So that, that's, a, that's a heavy thought, and we kind of need to tune in on, on what Jesus was doing here, what he was saying to them, and maybe even more important, why he was saying it to them. So, what I really want us to stop just a moment here and do is to consider the sequence that this sermon has taken so far. I don't know how many of you have ever gotten up and preached a sermon. I know a couple of you in here have, uh, or taught a class, taught a less, uh, uh, some kind of Bible study lesson or whatever, but you know any kind of endeavor to teach anything, even if it's not the Bible, is to come up with an outline that will guide your audience, guide their thoughts and their thinking toward the main point you're trying to make. And that's the model I tend to follow. I, t- I tend to follow what I call the main point model. Uh, I know a lot of guys get up here in the pulpit, a lot of men do, and they preach what are typically called three-point sermons. I've got nothing against them. Uh, it's not my particular uh, way I like to look at things or, or try to do it, but uh, there are people who do it masterfully. Adrian Rogers was considered kind of the king of the three-point sermon. Uh, if you listen to John MacArthur, he, uh, he doesn't so much uh, preach three-point sermons as often as he, as he does four- and five-point sermons, uh, but he does tend to preach for about an hour and 15 minutes. And assuming that uh, I won't have that, if I were to follow that model, I would probably keep it at three also. But that's really not what I do. What I really try to do is come up with a central point, a central main thing that when, when people leave here, that that's kind of what sticks with them. And I am just amazed at the genius and the brilliance of the sequence that is being laid out in this sermon that began up there really in verse one. So... As I've, and some of this I've kind of said before, but I'm going to kind of bring it all home now. I want you to see this morning why I have mentioned this before. Uh, as you know, and, and we've been in this several weeks now, Jesus begins with listing out the characteristics of kingdom citizens, the people who are going to get in the kingdom. He listed out uh, the, the makeup, the personal makeups, how, the spiritual makeups of those people. He did that in what we call the Beatitudes. And as I told you several weeks ago, the traits in the Beatitudes, those characteristics, were not the traits people expected to hear. In fact, what he lists lists out in the Beatitudes are the exact opposite of what they had always been told. That, you know, this idea about meekness and showing mercy and and, uh, those type things, that, that was not what they had been taught. And he follows that up, and, and I've, I've tried to get up here and, and lead us through all these things. I don't know how well I've always done it, but, you know, he follows that up. He says, here's the characteristics of the kingdom people. Then he follows that up with promises of persecution and the blessings that will come with it. He, uh, he kind of uh, got specific in that. He says the people who have these characteristics, who are going to be in my kingdom, they're going to be mocked behind their backs 
They're going to be insulted to their faces, and they're going to have all kinds of gossip and rumors uh, told about them. Uh, they're, they're going to be outcast of society. They're not going to fit in. And uh, that was the exact opposite of what they expected here because what they're seeing are scribes and Pharisees and these people in the hierarchy of Judaism. You know, when you reached a certain spiritual status, you got a certain robe and you got certain tassels and you got these adornments and, and you got to sit at the head places of tables and, and uh, you were highly esteemed. Uh, the more spiritual you were considered in Judaism of, of this day, the more you were esteemed. The last thing you expected, the, people, the guy getting it right, was to be persecuted, that God would allow that to happen to, to one of his own. So, so they're caught off guard by that. He comes back after that and he explains, but even in spite of this, you are my influences. You and you only are my influences in the world. You are to be salt. And we talked, uh, we, we, we really broke that down and, and dissected that. And he said, you are to be light. And we really broke that down and talked about that. We're to be salt in that we are to retard, impede the decay of, of a sinful uh, society and culture around us. And we are to be light in that we are to evangelize, spread the, the, the truth of the gospel, share that and make that known. To, uh, to, to, the, to the lost around us, just like Jesus, uh, as someone said, uh, to, uh, that he came to, uh, to uh, seek and save that which was lost. And we, uh, that's what it means to be light, to, to, uh, to go share that light with them. So now in verses 17 and 20, Jesus says, uh, he says, first of all, that uh, he will not abolish the law. He's going to fulfill it. I think I talked two Sundays on that, exactly what that meant. That uh, and we talked, we we broke down the law, the various components of it, so on and so forth. He follows that with the statement that says, "My followers, my true followers, are going to keep the law," and uh, we kind of narrowed that down to the moral law or the Ten Commandments, and we backed that up with showing that every one of the Ten Commandment commandments except one is actually mandated to the church in the New Testament epistles. Uh, the only one accepted that is not. Uh, uh, pointed to the church is to, to keep the Sabbath. That, that's the one commandment that the church is not given. So we, we went through all that. We spent the last two or three weeks doing that. And today we get to this verse 20 where Jesus says his followers must possess a righteousness that surpasses what they think. Now Jesus personified it by saying scribes and Pharisees, but what he's really saying here. They're righteous. They, they must possess a righteousness that surpasses what they think righteousness is supposed to look and sound like. In other words, what's in your minds as to what righteousness looks like, what it sounds like, Jesus says, if your righteousness doesn't far surpass what you've been trained in and what you've been told, you're not going to get into the, the, the kingdom. You see, that was the whole problem. Jesus' Jesus' audience thought righteousness looked a certain way, or it sounded a certain way, and as long as it met that, then their righteousness was righteous enough. But verse 20 introduces them to an entirely different approach to righteousness, and this was an approach they had never heard. And it was one that they much less understood. And now Jesus is off in territory they weren't expecting to hear, and they don't know what to make of this because the scribes and Pharisees were their target. That was who they were measuring themselves against. And Jesus, in very clear terms, says, if it doesn't surpass that, if it doesn't surpass that, we won't be seeing you in the kingdom. And I'm just going to put this line in here before I read that verse again. I often wonder if the church, much of the church, has fallen into that same trap. And we've come to believe that if righteousness sounds a certain way, looks a certain way, has a certain haircut, does things a, a certain, according to a certain regimen, that we're getting it right when maybe... Sometimes we're not getting it right at all. 
And that's what I want us to think about this morning. So let's go back to verse 20, read that again. That is our focus this morning. For I say to you that unless your righteousness doesn't just surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees, the New American Standard says far surpasses, far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the first thing you may notice here, Jesus is clearly targeting. He's actually attacking the scribes and Pharisees. It's almost one of those situations where he makes a statement like that, and you've got scribes and Pharisees that are there in the audience, and don't you know they just wanted to say, we're standing right here. And he says it right in front of their faces. And he says to the multitudes, or to his disciples, who at least were close enough to hear him, if, if your righteousness doesn't surpass this group, you're not getting in. And they're standing right there. You know, attacking the scribes and Pharisees was something Jesus did from the beginning of his ministry to the very end. He never relented. He never eased up on them. It actually began at his baptism when he's first announced as, as the Messiah. Uh, John the Baptist, it, John the Baptist is who said these words, but it, no doubt had Jesus' endorsement. They've come out to the Jordan to see what's going on with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, Matthew 3, says he looks at them, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, How's this? Did he say to them, good to see you today. Glad to have you today. No, they show up to, for his baptism at the Jordan. And John says this, you offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, greeters, I don't know that that's what we need to take, but that kind of the same. John the Baptist had been the greeter that morning and the scribes and Pharisees show up. Just imagine someone saying that to them coming in the door. Yeah, who told you to come here and, and, uh, say, and, and get yourself in, in better shape? And this never, I mean, Jesus never let up on these people all the way throughout his ministry. Right here in his first sermon, his first recorded sermon, he makes this statement. Unless your righteousness far surpasses these guys, you're not going to get into the, to, to the kingdom. All the way through the Gospels, you can read time and time again about his confrontations with these people. We've been studying from his first recorded sermon. If you go to his last recorded sermon, which, which is in Matthew 23, this is the, the week of his execution, and he's in the temple. This one last sermon, he's got the scribes and Pharisees right in front of him. He's going, this is his last word to the scribes and Pharisees. It's in Matthew 23. I'll just give you a few quotes from, the, from his last sermon. Matthew 23, 1. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. Later down, verse 13, he says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Down in verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one a proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Down in verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness, which we looked at last week. That John tells us that is sin. Sin is lawlessness. Down in verse 32, fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? Now, folks, 
to stand up and say that to a group of people who were probably in the first row, probably sitting up closest, and to get a scolding like that in front of the crowd. Let me tell you something. The reaction was predictable. This kind of language is actually what got Jesus killed. Matthew 21, when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. They're trying to figure out what are we going to do with this guy to eliminate him. They wanted to eradicate Jesus. Y'all read a book one time said had he left the scribes and Pharisees alone, he could have survived his ministry. He could have survived having a little sect out here, a little break off branch who, who uh, were willing to call him the Messiah. But when he went after the scribes and Pharisees, and the book went on and made, a, made even a stronger point, said what he was really going after, what they really felt threatened by was he was going to mess up the money. The, the whole tax system and the way that, that the Judaism funded itself, that what he was going after was, was the money flow. I don't know if you've seen how similar that is to draining the swamp, but, but you kind of get, when people start hearing words like drain the swamp, they get real defensive all of a sudden, and, and uh, it kind of makes you wonder who's, who's drinking out of the swamp. Later on, Matthew 26, then the chief priest and the elders of the people were gathered together. Now it's escalated. Boy, Jesus has kept up these attacks. He's been relentless. So in Matthew 26, then the chief priest and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. He's been given the death sentence by the scribes and Pharisees. They've had enough. They've had enough of this Jesus putting them in their place. Yet we've got a verse right here from his first sermon going all the way back says, if your righteousness doesn't far surpass theirs, you will not enter the kingdom. And it begs the question, why was Jesus going after the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, we just, several of those excerpts I just gave, gave you from his last sermon in 23 tells you why, but if we just kind of want to neaten that up and tidy it to a, to a little bit better list, here's why he was going after the scribes and Pharisees in a nutshell. They were obviously, we can pick up from those passages, they were inverting things of lesser importance over and above uh, things of greater importance. They were making mountains out of the molehills and making molehills out of the mountains, so to speak. They were focused on the wrong things and they were making a priority of things that didn't matter nearly as much. They were focused on externals, and we know from those statements Jesus made in Matthew 23 that while they were focusing on the externals, all the while they were themselves rotten to the core on the inside. They were focused on themselves, concerned with appearances and reputations, wanting honor and esteem, all the while camouflaging themselves behind a cloak of false religion. And this, by the way, is why they are so oftentimes referred to as vipers. The camouflage, the, 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 the pretending to be something they weren't, the trying to hide what they really were. I mean, that's what serpents and vipers do, right? They, they try to look like tree bark. They try to look like leaves. They try to look like uh, things. Uh, it's more of a defense than an offense. I, I, I know in the animal world, but they were camouflaging themselves where people could not see what really their inner thoughts were where their hearts really were, where their minds were. And they did this with an external religion, that, and Randall's talking about this back here in the Sunday school class a good bit, and that's what they were doing. Jesus pretty much summed it up in another statement that Luke tells us about. Uh, here's, here's another place he went right after him in Luke 16. says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, we're listening to all these things. They're, they're listening to this stuff Jesus is teaching, and we're scoffing at him. And he said to them, Jesus turns right at him and says to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight 
of God. And he pretty much just said, God hates what you're doing. God hates who you are. God hates who and what you are. He's not seeing what you're doing. He's, he's not seeing these externals. He's looking somewhere far deeper than that, and he despises and finds detestable what he is seeing. And it begs another question for me. When I read the Gospels and I read that, these that all these confrontations that Jesus had with the scribes and Pharisees, I'm wanting to know why did the people not recognize it too? Why did, why did, did the, the Christies and the Bettys and the Randalls and Kims and, and Rebecca's, and why did the people who are watching the scribes and Pharisees, why are they not getting any whiff of the hypocrisy? Why are they not seeing that, that they're getting it wrong? And when I looked into this and started studying it, the answer became pretty apparent. They didn't recognize it because they didn't know any better. What the scribes and Pharisees were doing was exactly how they had been trained to think. They didn't know any better. Well, why wouldn't they know any better? They didn't know any better because by this time, by the time Jesus is preaching this sermon, the common average Jew no longer could speak or read Hebrew. The scribes and Pharisees had dibs on the Old Testament. They had to read it and they had to explain it. And they explained it the way they wanted to explain it. Tell you what, it happened in the Christian church. At the time of the Reformation, the church was saying, which would we now call the Roman Catholic Church, at that time it was just the church because that's all there was, they had mandated that all the services, that scripture had to be read in Latin. Well, by the 16th century, you know how many people were speaking Latin and reading it fluently? Hardly anybody. And the church did not want translations. And if you want to go back and read about Wycliffe and some of these early martyrs who lost their lives horrendously in many cases for translating the scriptures into the vernacular languages, into English. You know, King James authorized the one we started with, but you had translations going on in other languages too to get God's word into the hands of the people so they could read it for themselves. And boy, the church just absolutely was not going to have any part of that. And they killed anybody that they thought was doing it. They, they outlawed translating scripture and it was punishable by death. Read about Wycliffe. This guy is just a hero of the faith. That, that uh, We need to study him, I think, more than even Martin Luther a lot of times uh, for the role he played in getting the Bible translated into languages that the people could get God's word in their own hands. Now, here's what the Pharisees and scribes, when they're translating the Hebrew for the people, are conveniently leaving out. They're leaving out verses like 1 Samuel 16, 7, that says, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Or maybe 1 Chronicles 28, 9 that we just read, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. Maybe 2 Chronicles 16, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You wonder sometimes why God doesn't get behind you and bless uh, some of what you're wanting to try to do, guess what he's looking at? Your heart. James even tells us, he says, a lot of times your prayers don't go answered because why? You're asking with the wrong motives. And I'm going to tell you something. From experience, I can tell you, I've had prayers that seemed to me like God would just be tripping all over himself to try to answer quickly and seemed like answers didn't come. And when I pray the prayer, God, show me where my motive is wrong. Tell me where I'm missing this. I know it's me. He usually shows me. And he'll open up my eyes and mind to, to things that, that I wasn't even seeing in myself. That's how corrupt we really are, by the way. Our hearts are deceitful above all things. And we convince ourselves we're doing things for the right reason. We, we, we've got this all lined up. 
and for some reason it doesn't seem to get very far with God and we say, well, God open up my eyes to where my motives are wrong. And sometimes that can be a very painful uh, exercise. Psalm 7, 9, God tries the hearts and minds. Proverbs 16, all these are from the Old Testament. Proverbs 16, 2, all the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. And they weren't being taught this. And they couldn't read it for themselves in the Hebrew. They weren't being taught this. They were being taught, you no, know, it's all about the externals. So, back to this sequence of thought, back to this organization of this, the, the brilliance of, of this outline. Just let me go over this just again real quick. First in the Beatitudes. What I see here, by the way, this is a progression. When you start at the beginning of the sermon and you start working down, this is a progression of heads exploding, as we say in the modern day. He gives them this, their heads explode a little bit. And as if that's not enough, he gives them a little more and their heads explode even more. And it just seems like that the explosions are getting bigger and louder and more intense. He's, he begins with the Beatitudes. He lists out the characteristics that couldn't possibly have been more opposite than the characteristics they thought a truly righteous person possessed. Then he proceeds with saying the truly righteous people will be persecuted, not honored and esteemed. And now their heads really start to explode, and I would say especially the scribes and Pharisees. Now Jesus is saying the very people you think are getting it right, in fact, they're getting it wrong and they're frauds. And if your righteousness cannot rise above what you're seeing in them, you are not getting into the kingdom. And you can just imagine the, the, the tension that exists right now. If you're one of the people out here, you don't know whether to make eye contact with a scribe or Pharisee. You don't know whether to look over there. You're looking at the ground. You're moving your feet around. You don't know whether you need to look at Jesus because the scribes and Pharisees may be looking at you. This is a really, really tense moment. You say, okay, Jesus, you've made your point. Let's, let's, bring, the, let's, let's bring the gear shift back. Let's slow it down here just a little bit. You slapped them right in the face with this. Let, let's calm things down a little bit. And let's sweeten this up a little bit. And let's make this a little easier to swallow. And what does Jesus do from here for the rest of the chapter? He starts giving illustrations to prove his point. And if you look on down, if you've got it open, you look down, Matthew 5, 21, he starts talking about the subject of murder. And with every one of these, he says, you've heard... You've heard it said, but I'm saying, and every time he says you've heard it said, what he's talking about is, he, Matthew didn't include this, it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus said it, but when he says you've heard it said, what he's saying is you've heard it said by them. You've heard this said by the scribes and Pharisees. He starts picking them apart, example after example. Verse 21 talks about the subject of murder. You've heard it said, but here's what I say about murder. Verse 27. Here's what you've heard about adultery. Well, here's what I've got to say about adultery. Verse 31. Here's what you've been taught about divorce. Well, here's what I've got to say about divorce. Verse 33. Subject of taking vows. Verse 38. The subject of vengeance and retribution. Verse 43. On the subject of enemies. And he's saying one after another after another. You know, a lot of people read the Sermon on the Mount and they think Jesus got through with this and then he just starts going off on these tangents. Oh, he wants to pick on murder for a minute. Now he wants to pick on adultery for a minute. No, these are all, when you read, when you read it in sequence, you've got to understand, now he's using examples. I want to give you illustrations of why your righteousness has to exceed the scribes and Pharisees. You've heard them say this, well, that's not really the way it is. You've heard him say that, well, that's not really the way it is. 
And that's the way you have to read the Sermon on the Mount. When you understand these things, suddenly you start to see, yes, this was one sermon. These are not excerpts that Matthew just kind of hodgepodge together. So he goes through this whole list of things that they've heard. I want you to notice something else, too. I'm just going to interject this in here. There's even a brilliance to his illustrations because the way that they grow in scope. He starts out with murder. In other words, you've heard it said about this aspect of, of the individual. Then he gets into adultery and divorce. Now he expands it in. Now, you've heard this said about your families. Now, here's some laws I'm going to lay down about the families. Then he goes into uh, the people in our social and cultural circles. In other words, Jesus takes their little world. He starts, you know that guy that you just thought about wanting to kill? Guess what? You committed murder. Oh, you want to bust your family wide open? Let's talk about adultery and divorce. Oh, you want to talk about what's our attitude toward the world around us and the lost? And he's, there's a brilliance to that, too. That's not the subject this morning, but just the genius that's here is just, you, you just, uh, every time it seems like you stick your shovel in it to try to dig out another truth, it just opens up a whole, a whole new mother load of, of just stuff to hit you with. But in a nutshell, what Jesus was telling the people was that what they had been taught by the scribes and Pharisees, this is obvious to us, it didn't go nearly far enough. And in the end, what they had been taught wasn't nearly broad enough, wasn't nearly deep enough. And that if they didn't go deeper than that with it, that what they had been taught would send them straight to hell. So what do we get out of this message this morning? I'm about to wrap it up. The thoughts and attitudes behind any act, whether it's coming to church Sunday morning, coming to church Wednesday night, it's the thoughts and attitudes behind any act that are more important than the act itself. Now, the act has to be there. The act has to be there, but it has to be supported. The external has to be supported by the right internal, else the external has no value. I hate to tell you that, but that's just the truth. Now, I will tell you this. If you want one little trick, C.S. Lewis said, in how you do this, he said, well, let's just say you're in, I'm, and I'm really par I'm paraphrasing him because he said this so much more eloquently, but he basically said it like this. If you're having trouble loving your neighbor and you just can't do it, Lewis said, do it this way. Start acting like you love him and pretty soon you will. And there's a lot of truth in that. You can the external can influence the internal. I'm not denying that at all. Obviously, God's standards of righteousness are much broader and higher than the mere externals. And Jesus is saying to these people, you think you're obeying the law, but really you're not. So here, let me redefine it for you. And that's what he does throughout the remainder of chapter 5. It's a sobering thought. And I said sometimes I wonder if the church hasn't fallen into this. Most of you here, a lot of you here, were here when we had a different kind of worship service here. And I'm, I'm not, I, I really want to be gentle with this because I don't mean it anything but. But many of you were here during, during the days when we incorporated a lot of external elements in our worship services here. Those of you who were, who were here, you'll remember we had the pyramids, we had the advent wreaths and candles, we had the acolytes, we still light the candles, we've kind of eliminated the acolyte part of the service. And these are all items that come from what I call liturgical Protestantism. And when we transitioned into being Grace Community Bible Church, we, we set a lot of that stuff aside. At least for a while. I don't know if it was in our minds that this would be a forever thing. Uh, here's kind of the thing about it. Those elements, I don't disagree with the truth they, they're supposed to represent. I, I don't disagree with what they are trying to symbolize. I, I really don't. 
And I understand that the intent of, of when they got incorporated into worship here, I don't think there was any uh, uh, sinister bad motive in it, that, that it was a way to externally worship. Uh, you know, the one thing I did like about the Acolytes was it gave the youth some participation in the services. I mean, that, that's not all bad. But the, and the reason we really mainly decided to, to uh, that we would go down a different path with Grace Community Bible Church is it, really a, a lot more uh, intellectual than that or a lot more theological than that. We teach, if you will read our statement of what we teach, we are a dispensational church. We teach a dispensational theology. And those elements are very much part of what is known as covenant theology. And I don't, I don't have time this morning to get into what those differences are. That would be a good Wednesday night course for us to get into a little bit deeper. What's the difference between dispensational hermeneutic and a covenant hermeneutic? And there's a lot of differences. And frankly, probably the majority of the Protestant church follows the covenant model. But those are all elements. The, these, these, what I call the liturgical Protestantism, are very much associated with covenant theology. And what, what we really got into, we didn't get rid of that stuff because we said, oh, that's wrong to symbolize the light of Christ, or that's wrong to, to, to uh, uh, you know, what the Advent candles represent. That wasn't it. The reason was because if we are going to announce ourselves as a dispensational church, when people come in the door and see elements of, of a different hermeneutic, it was going to be confusing. And basically what in a lot of people's minds it would have been is, okay, you're teaching one theology, but you're using elements from another theology in practice. And we just thought, you know, well, at least for a while, that, that could be kind of confusing. Let's just time out at least on some of these externals. But there is a danger in the externals. Now, those of you who weren't here part of the Acolyte, what would happen is they would come down with a, and they would take the, the, the they would extinguish, extinguish one candle, take the flame from the other candle, and they would walk up the uh, aisle out of the sanctuary. That would end our service. And what that was supposed to symbolize was carrying the light of Christ out into the world. What's wrong with that? Nothing in and of itself. I mean, in this very sermon right above, Jesus called us to be light of the world, Right? There can be a danger in that stuff, though, and I just warn us of this. Over time, you can start to watch these external elements and begin to believe that's it and forget that it's we who are the light. It's not that candle. And sometimes I wondered when I watched, we would all turn and we would watch this light go out the door if somewhere even in our subconscious we're thinking, okay, there's the light of Christ. We've just sent the light of Christ out into the world. And I wanted to stop and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. That was a candle. Are you the light of Christ going out into the world? And that's what you fall into sometimes when you get into these external elements of worship. So, I've been asked, are we going to ever bring those back? And I'll just close out by answering it this way. We're probably not anytime soon. But again, it's not because we are, are railing against what they stood for. or We're not anti uh, the people who, uh, who were brought up more in that kind of tradition or, or wanted it seen done here. It's, I'm not saying anything negative about it at all. I just think for who and what we are right now, it's better that we, that we not. As far as I know, the, the elders are in agreement on this. So uh, to answer that question, I'll, I'll answer it that way. And I think this sermon that, that I've just finished does back that up. That what's going on on the inside prioritizes whatever the externals are. So I go back to kind of what I said in the announcements this morning. I don't get so much into is this high church, low church. Is it, is it traditional? Is it contemporary? I don't really get into all that. What I want to know is, is it reverent? Is it reverent? And that's what I want our worship services to be. And folks, it doesn't get reverent 
until the hearts and minds, until our hearts and minds are in the right place when we congregate and do this thing we call worship. And that's my thought this morning.